Well, good morning, Rogers Park, and good morning, the world, because the world is coming to Chicago this week, which is the topic of today's show. I uh, just want to let you know it's a, a slight sprinkle outside. We've got a lot of great folks inside chomping on the uh, buckwheat pancakes and listening to some uh, great activist folks. We're going to have uh, James Jordan, the National Coordinator of Alliance for Global Justice here, Dennis Nelson of Nuclear Ener Energy Information Service, both of whom are taking a an environmentalist approach to the events of the coming week here in Chicago. Um, and, but we're going to start out with a familiar face and a uh, an incredible human being, Miss Kathy Kelly. Good morning, Kath. Hello, Katie. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Good to have you again. I was so glad, actually, um, to find out that we'd get you uh, today because when you left here uh, well, a month ago or whenever it was that we talked, we had not even touched the drones uh, question, which you had... Uh, you handed me a, fly, a, le a booklet about, right, um, right. which was, I guess, the hearing that, uh, was that recounting the hearing that was held? I, d I don't know exactly know the topic of that book. I, it was I a, scanned a hearing. We, we were on trial in Nevada because we had crossed the line. This was actually in April of 2009, and it took a long time for the trial to take place. Um, and very unusually, the judge allowed us to call as an expert witness Ramsey Clark, U.S. former Attorney General Ramsey Clark. Good guy. And Colonel Ann Wright and Bill Quigley, who was at the time the director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. And, uh, you know, the, the way the courtroom was situated, I was uh, in what would normally be the jury box. We didn't actually have a jury, so they asked, uh, the, we were 13 defendants, and they asked us to sit there. So I could see the entire group in attendance in the courtroom and honest to goodness there was not hardly a blink people were wrapped paying so much attention it was just that interesting to hear Ramsey Clark and Ann Wright and Bill Quigley testify in this courtroom and the judge was interested and the prosecutor kept trying to say that can know, we cut this off yeah and the judge <laughs> said I, I see where you're going but I really want to hear these people so he wanted his day in court so the judge then said he needed four months to think about it and then he found us guilty. But I'd rather be found guilty by somebody who took four months to think about it than somebody who said, well, it's lunchtime. Was this the, the event that led you to Pekin? No, 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 no I didn't no. think so. In fact, the right. judge only imposed time served, which we'd already done as a, an overnight in their county jail. But this was an important event because uh, so seldom has public opinion been invited to think about drones. And one way is to go into the judicial system and try to raise it as an issue of law. Right. And uh, we then also did an action in Syracuse at the Hancock Airfield. And it was the same thing. The judge, in fact, allowed 41 hours of testimony. This never happens. Where we? Uh, and then found everybody guilty. Uh, <laughs> but they're, they're listening in these courtrooms. And so Brian Terrell, who wrote that pamphlet, turned the trial into a play. Um, ah. has now crossed the line at Whiteman Air Force Base. Now, he really will very likely, he and uh, two others, face some time. He's a co-coordinator of Voices for Creative Nonviolence. So. And where is he? Is He's here right in Chicago right now. He'll, um, he lives in Malloy, Iowa, but there are a group who are gathered for the Catholic Worker Faith and Resistance Retreat, and um, that's where I'll be headed next, and Jake Olson is here from that grouping. And All So right. people are thinking hard about what kinds of actions to take that are commensurate to the kinds of crimes that are being committed. Now, we were contacted and um, hooked up with via Danny Postal um, having Medea Benjamin on, our, on this stage on Monday night. Th yes, that is Medea Benjamin, one of the founders of Code Pink, will be here Monday night. I'm thrilled. Um, but together, you, Medea, um, and uh, you need to say her name of the Afghanistan woman. Oh, Malalaya Joya. Joya, yes. Ma say that again. Malalaya Joya. So what is the, the women's gathering that's happening that you, you guys are holding down the fort for? Well, I think what the, this uh, stems from is uh, uh, one of the um, 
articles that Curtis Black has put together. He he kind of pulled from the three of us views about NATO and then made an article called Women Against NATO. Uh, Medea has written a very, very fine book on drones. And she has really, as, as, as only Medea can do, I think, combined activism with research, with speaking and education. So she'll be in town um, on the 17th at Reba House speaking about drones and helping launch her book. And I'm sure she'll have several other events along with your event on Monday night. On Monday, night. right. So it's, it's the Shadow Summit for Afghan Women's Rights that I read but as you said by Curtis Black that mentioned the three of you the Shadow Summit is happening next weekend right? Well and there's also a summit happening this weekend we've got two summits going uh, on yeah uh, the People Summit is this today and tomorrow right? right right and that's at 500 West Cermac uh -huh. and where do people find I, I have a schedule for that but if you uh, look up People Summit uh, you'll probably come up with the uh, there's huge amount of uh, workshops and events over today and tomorrow. That's true, and uh, many, many people are coming in for those. I, th I think it's important, I think that actually the uh, arrival of the heads of state and their entourages for NATO has occasioned much more education about the abuses of NATO and the wrongheadedness of NATO than ever would have happened had they not come here. And that's valuable, but we have to then move from education to action. So, uh, talk about NATO for a minute. What do you think are the most um, enlightening lessons that people are getting or gleaning from the preparations for this uh, gathering and the preparations for reacting to it. And well, acting. locally, people certainly are learning that $55 million was spent for the city to host NATO over two days while schools are closing and mental health clinics are closing. I don't think we can afford NATO and it would be much better to have a retirement party if we were going to have anything for NATO because it's been one long history of missed opportunities. Not only did NATO abrogate the anti-ballistic missile shield treaty, which is a complete violation even of our own laws, not only did they continually bring in new states bordering on Russia in order to further provoke Russia, even after the dismantlement of the Soviet Union, when there was a real opportunity to try to build long-lasting peaceful relations, but then they went and invaded Afghanistan. And um, all of that military aggressiveness has undermined the potential of groups that are unarmed that might have had more say in world affairs to be able to accomplish any progress. I think that was, NATO's... Was there a moment in NATO's history where they actually had that as part of their mission? To involve the unarmed populace in... Mm, I don't think don't so. Think I think so. in its inception right. there arguably was a purpose for NATO when it seemed like Stalin might try to invade European countries. But I think actually the United States was interested to have NATO as a, a way of military enforcement at a time when the United States recognized that it was a good idea to, for U.S. interests to rebuild the European countries through the Marshall Plan mm -hmm. so that they would then move from coal consumption to oil consumption for energy at a time when the United States controlled one-third of the world's oil production. Um, the United oh. States then benefited from Europe being there as a consumer and also as, a, as more substantial trading partners. That is the first time and I've ever heard that connection made. And Thank by, you. by creating this North Atlantic Treaty Organization, they then kind of had um, a militarized force. And you can see that the times when it's been invoked have always been times when it's been in the U.S. national interest and it's been cloaked as or sold as uh, a, a way of humanitarian intervention. But that's simply not true. Not, not in Kosovo, not, I don't think, in Libya more recently and certainly not in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and so it's a good idea to, to examine what has NATO actually accomplished. I mean, if you look at Kosovo, the number of um, uh, human rights abuses that Slobodan Milosevic was accused of, and, and they were hideous. Um, Double hideous. Yeah. Occurred after NATO began bombing. Right. Eleven of those abuses that he went on trial for occurred, including Srebrenica, occurred after NATO had begun military intervention. And when we look at, 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 at Libya today, I mean, Médecins Sans Frontières pulled out of Libya because the group that NATO helped usher into power has been in the habit of 
torturing prisoners and then calling Médecins Sans Frontières in to kind of get them healed up just enough so that they could continue torturing them to get more information out of them. And so Médecins Sans Frontières, these doctors with, without borders said, that's it, we're out of here. And it, When did that happen? Ah, forgive me, I don't have the exact month, in, uh, but, it but it was probably about six months ago. Really? You can find it that in the recently. New York Times, yeah. That's an incredible story as well. So the idea that, that NATO has um, somehow been accomplishing a humanitarian intervention in Afghanistan and saving people from the Taliban is, is, is utterly false. The, uh, the numbers of women and children who died in the last year at the hands of the U.S. forces were greater than the numbers of those who died at the hands of the Taliban. Uh, overall, the Taliban killed more people, but if you just look at women and children, NATO killed more, the combination of NATO and U.S. forces. And then, of course, um, the, the kind of um, spearheading of NATO, if you will, is, is really something the United States is responsible for. We're the country that has spent half of what all of the countries in the world have spent on weapons and defense. Or another way of looking at it is that the United States spends more on defense than the next 18 countries after it combined. Yeah, because um, we have so many people knocking at our door with big guns. That's the other thing. Right? We're, we've got one of the most impregnable geographical settings possible. It's not like we're worried that Mexico or Canada are going to Oh, no, to we're very us. worried. The Mexicans who cross the border in their feet. With, uh -huh. You know, yeah. As you've been to so many of these places right in the middle of conflict, um, which we thank you for, uh, to be the witness that we'd all, we all need. You, you are the witness we all need on the ground. Do you, and you are huddled with people in their homes who are under threat of bombs and bombing going on around them. Um, how is it, after 30 years of doing this, Kathy Kelly, how is it that the world leaders, and particularly our own leaders, particularly the guy we all elected four years ago, can't break through the militaristic point of view that almost all of the people of the world, certainly people in places that have had war, which Americans don't understand. They don't have that awareness. But I think most of the people of the world are ready to say no to war. I mean, a lot of us were ready to say no to war when we woke up during the Vietnam War and said, no, this isn't exactly what we thought it was. Um, well, you're certainly right, Katie, that the polls are showing um, vehement opposition to the war in Afghanistan. Uh, I think it's now 67% or more of the U.S. populace opposes that war, and 27% say they vigorously oppose the war. I, I think a lot of it comes down to jobs, 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 jobs. People may be able to clearly analyze the situation and say, this makes no sense, there's, there's no benefit, but the jobs are tied in with the military and um, so the military has tremendous clout if any senator or representative says well I want to close this military base or I want to close this weapon making company um, uh, then people will be out of work and they're afraid they won't have any alternative jobs and so that um, has been for the military industrial complex a, a perfect situation. They, they, they hold a huge threat over the US public. If you mess with us, you won't have jobs and you won't be able to so afford have, your lives. So we have that many military related uh, occupations. Yeah, when he, the I think Dwight Eisenhower, it was three days before his presidency ended, and he made a farewell speech and he warned about the military industrial complex. And if it's not the military industrial complex, increasingly it's the prison Penal. security complex, yeah. including all the lawyers. Right. And so between those two sectors, it becomes very uh, difficult to persuade these big huge profit makers that they could still make a profit and make things that are good for people and that are useful. Yeah, plow, plowshares, you know. Yeah, swords into plowshares. Plow um, what are your 
hopes for this week? I know the the walk that you talked about uh, last time you were on is currently happening, right? Yeah, I walked here from, 100 miles from Madison. Girl! <laughs> no blisters. Let's hear it for this girl. She walked here from Mo Madison. No blisters. You, you've, you've got the secret to the right shoes, boots, right? Well, I really should do commercials for New Balance and Seamless Socks. <laughs> <laughs> seamless Socks. Uh, how many folks took part in that overall, do you know? You know, mostly we were about eight walkers. Um, um, and that's okay. It made it a lot easier for overnight housing, and um, you know, we, we we're a modest effort in a way. But I, I really recommend this idea of every now and then dropping out of what seems to be normal. And uh, certainly, I'm way in fan of that. I am such a fan of that. I hope to do it again really soon. But. Uh, Go ahead, sorry. Interrupt well, and then um, the other thing is, is getting a chance to meet with communities face to face. And then for those of us who are walking, you know, not sitting home and being in front of a computer screen and clicking things and thinking we're being active. Uh, that's actually not activity. Right. It's important to get a different perspective now and then. Although we do appreciate when people click and sign that's their true. name to petitions, that does, I mean, there is a way that folks who are not normally active, who care about stuff, are able to at least put their put their uh, signature on stuff. For well, example, that's true, and I don't want to be a technophobe. Yeah, um, an anti-techie. Uh, well, um, in fact, uh, the kids in Afghanistan that I've mentioned before, they um, stay in touch with us through technology and very much through Skype phone calls to their cell phones. So I, I, I do want to acknowledge that we've so you're such had a, a lot techie. of inclusive. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm uh, I'm very impressed with, and I, again, when we were all demonstrating the Vietnam War, um, the veterans, the, the Vietnam vets against the war, uh, became the vanguard, the guys who walked in front of the march. Um, because fellow uh, policemen and uh, any other quasi-military who were called in to calm the demonstrators would basically step back they had a respect for the veterans. Mm. And there was that incredibly meaningful march that the Vietnam Vets Against the War um, uh, marched on the Pentagon and, and returned their medals. Um, evidently, the Iraq Veterans Against the War are going to be doing the same thing here in Chicago uh, on May 20th. In, and uh, they are asking people to click um, on the... Uh, a site that asks for the Illinois Guard not to be deployed against us. So um, you can look at uh, the Iraq Veterans Against the War website to put your voice on that one because I think that might have a little bit of sway mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. a few thousand people say, yeah, I don't want the Illinois National Guard to be deployed against veterans. Yeah, I think we owe a huge debt veterans. of thanks to the Iraq Vets Against War and the vets who also said they oppose the war in Afghanistan. Um, their voices are uh, filled, really, with raw pain many times. You know, we've all heard them uh, share their poems with us and some of their heartfelt feelings, and it's important for those gatherings to happen, um, both because of their credibility and, and also there, there is a lot of trauma that is resultant from the war. You know, 18 suicides happen every single day amongst the entire veteran community. 18? 18 a day. Per day. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Aaron Hughes has been on this show a couple mm -hmm. times, and you're right. I, you, you sit here and listen to him and look into his eyes. I've, he's brought me to tears twice mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. sitting here talking, you know, for 15-minute segments. Um, so I'm, I'm blown away at their bravery to yeah. stand up you know, and and be a and, and they've formed a real community amongst themselves that support one another. I've, re I've greatly admired them and felt privileged any time I'm around them. So yes, yes, we should all please support that action and certainly don't want the Illinois National Guard aiming at the veterans. Yeah, what, what events would you like to call people to for, or call attention to for folks listening? Because uh, our second series of guests will talk more about uh, some specific events next week and and of course the Chicago papers are full of where you can't be and where you shouldn't be and blah 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 but where should people be uh, next thanks. weekend and leading up to it? Well we're very happy that um, along with Medea Benjamin coming to talk about drones and I really hope people will be here Monday night to hear Medea. 
Um, on the weekend, David Swanson will be speaking uh, at 615 West Wellington. Um, he's the person who wrote the book War is a Lie, and um, more recently, uh, When the World uh, Put an End to War. He's got a very, very interesting take on the time in between World War I and World War II, when actually some of the corporate bigs were beginning to think maybe we can't afford these war efforts. Right. So David will be at 7 o'clock p.m. at 615 West Wellington, on May 19th. Uh, I'm sure hoping people will turn out in support of the National Nurses and their demonstration on the 18th. We're, we're going to walk into Chicago and have a press conference again at Wellington uh, in the morning at 10.30 uh, and then we'll go join the National Nurses for so, their walk. Uh, we had the National Nurses representative on the show last week. Oh, she, wonderful. Yeah, she was great. She talked all about, she gave good background to the march, good good history to the association um, and in the ensuing week we hear that the um. city um, I guess it's all based on the fact that they've got uh, Tom from Rage Against the Machine playing at their at their rally that that questions arose whether or not they have the permit that they already had to march uh, that day on Sat Saturday, right? Yes. Yeah, it's almost like um, these permits are in a revolving door. You yeah. have it, and then you don't, and then you have it, and then you don't. Uh. So that really does give a lot of fuel to people to say, oh, well, who cares? We're just going to march. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we should all remember that we have a First Amendment right to assemble peaceably for redress of grievance, and there, it's nonsense for the city of Chicago to say that they have the right to withdraw that um, very fundamental right to free speech. And you don't get freedom. You have to take it. You have to exercise it. And over and over again, it appears. But yeah. I do think that by turning the city into such an armed camp, the um, city of Chicago has scared many people and made many people feel like, well, I don't want to you know, get hurt. I don't want to get arrested. And uh, this is a pernicious kind of strategy, and it's happened right around the time when, on May 1st, President Obama announced 